Okay guys, welcome to the physics paper 2 revision video. As usual, you guys should know the draw by now. We're going to be going through a few different practice questions from past papers and based on past papers. So feel free to pause the video at any point and have a go for yourself. So if you look at the first question here, we've got a question, basically you can see we're working with waves. Okay, so the figure four shows the apparatus used to investigate the waves in a stretched string. The frequency of the signal generator is adjusted so that the wave shown in figure four is seen. At this frequency, the string vibrates between two positions shown in figure four. You can see there's a movable wooden bridge here, and then there's the vibration generator here. The wavelength of the wave shown in figure four was measured as 80 centimeters, and that's given to us in the diagram as well. What piece of apparatus would have been suitable for measuring this wavelength? So the first question is asking you is not really even about waves. It's just an experimental question. You should know, okay, if you want to measure 80 centimeters, what's an appropriate thing to use? So you can say something like a meter ruler. And that would be fine. Write down the equation which links frequency, wavelength, and wave speed. So this paper, I think, is from uh, when you might, well, I think it was from one of the pandemic era papers. So you probably won't get a question like this again, but you should know you can put it straight from your equation sheet V equals F lambda. Okay. Or you could write wave speed equals frequency multiplied by wavelength. And that would probably be the safer thing to do since we haven't actually defined the symbols in the question. Okay, string in figure four vibrates at 55 hertz. Calculate the wave speed of the wave shown in figure four. So it should be um, a fairly simple question here. Since we've already got the, the frequency, we have the formula that the wave speed is equal to the frequency multiplied by the wavelength. And in the above, we actually had that the wavelength was 80 centimeters. So all you need to do really is make sure that you convert the wavelength from centimeters to meters. So wave speed is going to equal, be equal to the frequency, which is 55 hertz. Now that's measured in hertz, so that's fine. Leave that as it is. And then the wavelength, you're going to write as 0.8 meters, okay? And if you put that into your calculator, you should get the wave speed of 44 meters per second. Okay, so that's the, the first question done. The second question then, the mean braking force on a car is 7,200 newtons. So we're looking at forces here. You're going to get a lot of forces questions on your exam paper. So this is a fairly simple one. You should be able to apply the equation here. The car has a mass of 1,600 kilograms. You want to calculate the deceleration. So immediately you're looking at force, you're looking at mass and acceleration, in this case, deceleration. Remember, deceleration is just negative acceleration, okay? So you should be able to identify the formula straight away. It's going to be F equals the mass multiplied by the acceleration all you need to do now is rearrange for the acceleration so the acceleration is going to be equal to the force divided by the mass now don't get caught out here even though it says acceleration in our formula you'll just get a negative answer for acceleration and then you can write that down as a deceleration okay that's basically all you need to do in this question so the the force is going to be 7200 newtons now technically speaking because this is a braking force if you want to say that the forces are defined as the positive is forward then you could put a negative over here and as mentioned then you'd get a negative acceleration which would translate as deceleration okay in this case we're just going to say that the basically the uh the backwards force the force going this way remember it's a vector quantity we're going to say that this is positive therefore we can just leave it at 7200 we divide through by the mass of 1600 kilograms and if you put that into your calculator you'd get an answer of 4.5 so the acceleration would be 4.5 meters per second squared or the yeah that's the deceleration or you could say the acceleration would be minus 4.5 meters per second squared if forward is positive okay so that's basically that question there the next question we'll ask you to work out the spring constant and we're giving this graph of force against extension so feel free to pause the video have a go how would you work out the spring constant from this graph so to solve this one, really, it helps if you're familiar with the equation for the spring constant. So remember, the force is equal to the spring constant multiplied by the extension. OK, so we'll write it as F equals KE. Now, this is basically giving us the, the formula for this line in this uh, in our graph. OK, so force is on the Y axis and e extension is on the X axis. So essentially, this is in the form Y equals mx okay and a lot of the time you'll see this as y equals mx plus c where c is your intercept and you can add an intercept here but because essentially what we're saying here that there is no intercept this is a plus zero basically so what that means is that the um the the line on a graph is going to pass through the origin which we can see it does over here okay 
So now that we know that, we know that F equals KE and we have I've linked it to our formula for a straight line and so basically what we can say is that the gradient of this line is m and if you compare our formulas we can see clearly that the gradient of the line would then give us k our spring constant so all we need to do is work out the gradient so to work out the gradient what you want to do is basically take two points because it's a straight line you can just take two any two points you want the gradient will be the same anywhere so let's just take two easy to read points you can do it from wherever you want i'm going to take one over here and then one down here okay so i'll just show you guys how to do it again you can do it with any points you want but if you zoom in all the way over here that's the maximum i can zoom in and we'll just try to make this point a little bit more accurate so you can see that along the corridor if you like the x coordinate is going to be 0.12 and up the stairs or or the y coordinate we need to just go across so you could use a ruler for this bit i would recommend but I'll just draw a line across and read it off there. So basically this will be 4.5. So this is 4.6, 4.7. Okay, so approximately 4.7. And it's a bit easier if the paper's in front of you. So you guys might get slightly more accurate answer. But there's our coordinates for that first point. Then we can go do the same thing for this second point. So again, I've chosen it as 0.02. And I'll just try to make it a little bit more accurate. It's over here. And so you do the same thing. You come across and you draw this. And that looks like 0.8. Okay, perfect. So now all you want to do is compare both of those to work out the difference in y over the difference in x. So for the difference in y, you just take away the y coordinates. So 4.7 minus the 0.8. And you want to divide that through by the difference in x. So the difference in x was 0.12 for the first coordinate uh, minus 0.02 for the second coordinate. And so go ahead and put those numbers into your calculator. So you should get uh, approximately 40 newtons per meter if you misread it slightly you might get something slightly off i think technically this calculation gives you something slightly different but it runs to 40 um, but if you do it exactly you should get 40 newtons per meter don't forget the units it is going to be in newtons per meter because the top was in newtons and the bottom was in meters if you look at the axes okay so that is it that's the gradient and that it relates directly to the spring constant Next question then, figure 5 shows how the speed of galaxies moving away from Earth varies with the distance of the galaxies from Earth. And you can see what figure 5 looks like. So we've got distance of galaxy from Earth on the x-axis and speed of the galaxy moving away from the Earth on the y-axis. And we've got a few different points here. So it's asking us which galaxy would show the smallest observed change in wavelength or visible light. So the smallest observed change in wavelength or visible light. And we want a reason for our answer, and we also need to tick the correct one. So A, B, C, or D. So if we look at A, B, C, or D in our figure, again, this question is asking us which would give us the smallest observed change in wavelength or visible light. So go ahead, have a go. Which one do you think it would be? So to understand this question, basically, we need to understand the phenomenon of redshift. And the idea is that the stars and galaxies are accelerating away from us. So if a galaxy is moving away from us, the speed of that galaxy is going to increase the further away it gets from us because there's acceleration, okay? And what that also means is that the further away a galaxy is, the more it has sped up and therefore the faster it's moving away from us, okay? And what we can then say, and you can see that in, in the trend, right? So as, as the galaxy, the distance from the uh, Earth increases, the speed of the galaxy also increases. Now, what that means is that when you observe that galaxy, the wavelength itself becomes stretched. And so in our question, which one show the smallest observed change in wavelength of light? So the wavelength is going to change more the faster the galaxy is moving away from us. OK, so essentially what you would say is that from our graph over here, you, could, you want to select A. And the reason that you would give is that it is either you could say it's the closest to Earth. Which is true. But really, the reason that uh, it being close to Earth means that we see the smallest observed change in wavelength is due to the fact that it's moving away from the Earth slowest. And what that means is that basically the slower you move away from Earth, the less the shift in wavelength you're going to observe. OK, so essentially that's what you'd say. You tick box A and that would be your reason. OK, next question. Figure 5 shows a solenoid. Draw the magnetic field of the solenoid in on figure 5. So this is a magnetic field question. For this one, really, you just need to commit the commit to memory what the shape of the field of a solenoid looks like. I'll give you a hint. It's very similar to a bar magnet. So go ahead. Have a go. So for this question, essentially what we have, um, we should know the basic structure, but let's go step by step. 
So we have the current flowing into the wire here and it's basically going to flow in this direction all around is going to wrap around come through here and you can see the direction of the current the whole way through so how then do we get the magnetic field from this current well we know that if we have a current wrapped around a, a tube like this if you have any current through a wire there's going to be a field around the wire when it's caught like this we will still get field but the shape of the field will be slightly different so as i mentioned it's very similar to a bar magnet and in the middle of the solenoid you'll get basically very um straight uniform fields lines like this all very close packed in together at, at the end of either end the field lines basically splay out like this and uh, it was a bit untidy, but essentially you get the idea that this is what the field lines would do. Um, and if it was a bar magnet, essentially these field lines would go all the way around and wrap around like this. So you could also draw it like that and that would be fine. But the last thing we want to actually put onto these field lines is the arrow. So we should know the arrows on the field line uh, will always point basically from north to south. So we need to be able to tell the direction of the field from our current. So what we want to do here is use your right hand screw rule. And so you basically you take your right hand and you take your fingers into a, almost like a screw. You screw them up like you're doing a thumbs up. You then turn it to the side and you put your you put your thumb in the direction of the field and your fingers will be going in the direction of the current. So essentially we don't know the direction of the field so we use our fingers here. So the fingers we want to orientate them so that they wrap around basically the hollow tube if you like um, and our fingers are going in the direction of the current. So basically our fingers should be wrapping around like this in the same way that the current is wrapping around. Okay so if you do that then you should end up if you've done it right with your thumb pointing towards the right hand side. Okay so we can see the field is in this direction and so all we need to do then is add on our arrows to our field lines which you can go ahead and do like that and you do the same thing over here as well okay and that's how you draw the, the magnetic field or the field lines of a solenoid okay and one of the last questions that you'll get or the last question we'll do together and one of the last questions on a paper potentially is this electric motor question so we're looking at motor effect so it is one that students do typically struggle with but really if you know your motor effect it should be fairly simple so you've basically got the classic motor you can see we've got a coil we've got a magnet around it we've got the coil axle over here we have uh, the split ring commutator which you guys should know all about with the carbon brushes and it's, that's connected to a, a dc circuit like that and the question is asking us when there is current in the coil the coil rotates continuously explain why so it's a four marker basically just explain the motor effect how do we get this continuous turning effect from this motor when we connect up the uh, the current in the coil okay so have a go what would you say for four marks so let's explain it step by step then and we'll use the diagram to help us out to see exactly what's going on. Um, so the first thing we can see is we have this current flowing through into our split ring commutator. And so other side of this commutator is attached to um, some of the uh, one of the one side of the coil, right? You can see the coil turning like this and the top one is attached to this top ring it looks like and the bottom one is attached to our bottom commutator like that. So what's happening then is you have a current going through your coil and so what happens is the sides of the coil which are parallel to the magnet they experience a force and because these uh, sides of the coil are attached to different sides of the commutator the current flowing through them is going to be in different directions so for example on the top one you might have the current going forward and on the other side you will have a current going backwards like that okay or in the reverse direction basically and so what's going to happen then is the, the current and the field will interact to produce a force so you should know that from Fleming's left hand rule and the direction of that force is going to change depending on what direction the current is going in since the field is constant right the field is north to south so this is always stays the same the only difference then between the two sides of the coil uh, which is going to cause the force to be in a different direction is the direction of the current okay so because one is going one way one is going the other way you end up producing a force that causes moments in the opposite direction okay so you have moments in one going up and one moment going down or rather one moment anti-clockwise one moment clockwise okay so uh, just go through the mark scheme then the first mark what you'd say is that the the size of the coil experience a, a force uh, you could say in opposite directions and that produces moments uh, in opposite directions or so clockwise and anti-clockwise that's two marks now the third mark then is basically 
that causes the coil to spin and it might spin uh, till it reaches a point uh, where the coil's up here and that's all fine but then at that point if you were to carry on connecting these uh, one thing is that the coil might get might get tangled but also the current wouldn't switch direction so you'd also end up with the same kind of with the same direction of force on both sides of the coil and as a result then the coil would basically spin back down uh, the other way so what you want is actually to switch it so that when this side of the coil reaches on this side so before it, it had a upwards force and then it wants you want to have a downwards force once it gets to this side okay so this is basically what you want to happen and the way you facilitate that is through the commutator so basically each half of a revolution the two halves of the commutator swap from one brush to the other so you can see the carbon brush is uh, over here and the advantage of this over a fixed connection is that these commutators can turn and they basically swap the uh, what side of the circuit they're connected to so this would basically be the negative side this is the positive side so when you swap them then you basically switch that and then as a result the commutator reverses the current in the coil and therefore keep the moments in the same direction but this side of the coil initially experiences a force upwards this side of the coil experiences a force downwards now if you don't switch the sides of the commutator then uh, essentially the coil will reach the midpoint and then it will start to turn in this direction so that this side of the coil would uh, be now going downwards right or it would want to go downwards force would still be in the upwards direction so that what would cause that to happen is that the coil would then basically switch direction and it wouldn't go in a smooth move rotation so instead you switch the direction of the current and as a result that means that on this side of the coil the direction switches so you have continuous force continuous downwards force on one side and a continuous upwards force on the other side no matter the uh, the fact that the sides of the coil are changing okay so that's basically uh, what we're looking at and that's basically what causes it to rotate continuously and that's what you'd say for the last two marks all right we'll leave it there then uh, hopefully you guys found that useful and uh, good luck with your exams